very first experience with Scarlatti was this footage of Michelangeli nailing the B minor sonata K27 that was part of a TV show called The Art of Piano and since then I was hooked forever. Years later I bought a second hand complete edition of the sonatas, the old Ricordi edition in 11 volumes by Alessandro Longo. It is the oldest almost comprehensive collection and the edition that makes rich use of slurs and staccato points and adds some corrections, which nowadays is probably not up to date anymore. Like most harpsichordists or pianists, I'm stoked by Scarlatti's individual treatment of the keyboard. His originality, or let's say his notorious eccentric style is nothing less than legendary, or in other words, declined into a cliché. He's clearly a musical figure about whom musicologists and critics are at issue up to this day. That guy's brain is a bag full of cats. I just think he's a genius. Since even Britney knows that he comes up with strange chords and obviously can't write a cadence without producing parallel fifths, I wanted to speak about a more interesting topic that seems to be completely neglected. Scarlatti's treatment of sequential episodes. And everybody following this channel knows that I've got a morbid obsession with this kind of topic. Scarlatti, rather famous for being a baroque dandy than a contrapuntal master, was actually born and trained in the cradle of Partimento, so he obviously must have had a certain concept of counterpoint and especially sequences, because the internalization of sequential patterns was a cornerstone of Italian 18th century Doro based training. I'm going to show you several examples that range from a level of mere trained stylistic control to a certain higher degree of construction, poetical imagination and artistically reflected employment that I consider as sheer mastery. So let's go! The first examples show this kind of baseline at a certain point. I call this the ascending fifth sequence which rises by fifth and falls by a fourth. A harmony book would describe it as a succession of root position chords. 18th century figure bass theory associates a particular figuration with this bass line. A chain of 4-3 suspensions that's going to be realized in three voices. This is a plain example that I would present to a student as transposable building block. Now three original examples containing this kind of formula. The first one is pretty standard, not very interesting and probably stems from an early period as it is explicitly written for the organ. If K287 is not an early sonata, it maybe is written for teaching purposes as it pretty much resembles the Italian intavoltura genre, paradigm pieces for young students with the scholastic purpose to demonstrate compositional standard devices. It is remarkable how plainly he presents the formula almost without any further embellishment. So this is what I would call a pretty simple standard example. Now I want to show you how Scarlatti transfers this conventional standard schema into something more interesting. In K224 you will witness a typical moment in Scarlatti's music when a certain structure is just released to let go starts to grow out of any proportion and seems to begin a life on its own. You will recognize the sequence as Scarlatti sticks again to the established chain of 4-3 suspensions. I start from the beginning of the sonata because the sequence is part of a contrasting idea, a sudden change of mood so to say. seem to collide in this example. The beginning represents a superficial gallant sphere of a mere finger music, the other one that of contrapuntal thought and contemplation. 
What I find most fascinating in Scarlatti is how he sometimes seems to exhibit them as abstract musical modalities that one puts on like a mask on a fancy dress party. Like he's composing music about music. Let's have a brief look at the sequence's architecture before I go completely astray. It's easier to grasp when it's reduced to its baseline. Although the listener perceives a stream of constant growth and blossom, the whole section can be divided into three consecutive phases of the sequence. Scarlatti augmented the level of complexity by integrating interjectional dominance as sixth chords or diminished seventh chords into the process, not just to link the sequential phases, but as well within the sequential modules. On top of that, he establishes a canon at the interval of a fourth. I know what you think. But in fact, this is not just a standard procedure that can go along with this special baseline. Believe it or not, canons, or let's say strict imitative procedures, are an implicit possibility of every single baseline that shows a constant alternating succession of certain intervals. In other words, every standard sequential baseline. What, you guys didn't know that? Hence, this feature should be counted among the matters of craft than the matters of art. If you want to learn more about this topic, you should put your nose into this book by Cherubini that you can easily find on the internet. Cherubini systematically examines alternating bass motions at their implied contrabundal possibilities, such as diminutions, suspensions and imitations. Instead of the rich use of contrapuntal devices like imitations and suspensions, he sometimes just picks up the broad brush but produces a great effect anyway like in the following bars that bring up the same sequence to contrast a half cadence in K479 in a manner that could be designated as flamboyant. I start from the phrase ending. comparison to the previous example it's primitive, but on the layer of key relations it reveals some compositional consideration by contrasting a half cadence in A major with the C major chord realized as a big arpeggio initiating a short moment of sequential flow within a complete different region of key. I think it's justifiable to claim that these bars point to a later period of style. I show you what I mean. This excerpt was taken from Czerny's Opus 740 Etudes. It's the same sequence, but that's not the point. It's rather more the kind of structure. Besides the harmonic tempo being twice as slow and the figurative pattern being slightly different, I think this is quite a similar way to realize the sequence. I think I'm gonna take a little digression. Let's have a quick talk on chronology issues, as we do have a special situation here. You might have heard that the chronology of the sonatas is totally unsure, as we don't have any manuscripts by the composer himself, but just two big beautiful convolutes by the same scribe, neither of them complete and of somewhat different contents, that present the sonatas in slightly different orders, beginning the compilation in a period that one could call Scarlatti's sunset years. Neither the Kirkpatrick numbers nor the Longo numbers represent an assured chronology, which is an extremely extraordinary situation as we all are used to trace and judge a stylistic and creative development throughout a composer's life. Imagine a situation having the 32 Beethoven sonatas without any biographical hint of their order. Maybe we'd see the Hammerklavier as a misguided attempt of a megalomaniac youngster. So when I'm labeling a Scarlatti sonata as probably late or early, I'm doing that with a disclaimer that these are just stylistic considerations. From a musicological standpoint, these can in fact be justified, but are nevertheless nothing but soft criteria. Compared to other big names of the Baroque era, Scarlatti makes comparable rare use of the most prevalent sequence, the circle of fifths. You have to dig for a bit to finally find one and all and in many cases these appear in a stylistic environment 
that I consider to be quite conventional or at least indicate a certain degree of compositional level that I would not consider as musical art but some sort of everyday craftsmanship routine. Hence in sonatas that I estimate as presumably early such as K35. It could be written by literally any Italian composer with a dusty wig and doesn't reveal any individuality at all. K35 represents a layer within the corpus of sonatas that with high probability are juvenilia from the composer's apprenticeship. A big share of the sonata's first half consists of two long and monotonic sequences. Nine of the 19 bars that form the first part of the sonata are sequential episodes, which makes around 50% of its entire content. first page is a simple circle of fifths sequence that reiterates the pattern until it reaches back to the tonic. The other one applies a chain of 2-3 suspensions onto a left hand pattern that is a diminution of a bass motion that falls by third and rises by step and that's used as an open loop just as long until it allows to exit to the dominant key. In the lowest system I show the fundamental bass progression that reveals an underlying circle of fifths. Both sequences are more or less some sort of improvisational stock material and you can be sure that Scarlatti was able to improvise such a piece already at a young age. Now I want to present an example that is quite special to me. This time it's probably familiar to you as the piece where I found the sequence is the A minor sonata K54 that appeared as second track on a famous Scarlatti recording by Horowitz. The circle of fifths blossoms right after entering the second rotation and appears just once in the whole sonata, so the sequence marks kind of an exposed situation right at the heart of a piece where every bar already is incredibly beautiful. I start with the final cadence of the first rotation so you can get the whole context. I want to try to describe why this dreamy sequence seems so remote. Most obvious is the fact that it temporarily brightens the mood towards the major side as the rest of the piece predominantly is on the night side of minor keys. To me this is a typical broad brush situation where everything seems to stand still for a second and all the details are put aside to generate some kind of panorama effect. The technical constitution of the sequence is comparatively plain and its succession totally foreseeable. Its morphology is, as standard succession of diatonic 7th chords, indeed simple. On the other hand quite remarkable in the uncommonly wide left hand accompaniment which creates a full and vast sound. If you want you can recognize as well an imitative structure here, even it's not leveled out that evidently. The main detail of sound probably is contributed by the appoggiaturas that always add a dissonant ninth, which creates the lush opulent sound. Even harder to find than the circle of fifths in the corpus of sonatas is the Romanesca, but I found an interesting one that I want to show you. To understand its oddities I want to remind you of the regular syntactical norms of this schema and for this purpose I give you a brief example. What's musical syntax you might ask? Syntax encompasses the grown rules of musical grammar, in other words phrase building. So it deals with the question on how tonal building blocks are put together to create something that we perceive as comprehensible musical sense. Of course linked to a certain layer of musical style, in this case 18th century music. What you see here is a typical Romanesca phrase consisting of three sequential modules plus an attached cadence, in this case a 251. 
A musical realization of this bass line could sound like this. In K251, a beautiful but strange Romanesca occurs within the events of the second rotation. The B section enters with completely new material that escapes into a remote lyrical sphere, contrasting the jolly world of the first rotation with some sort of a die-away atmosphere that is dominated by minor keys and a yearning suspension motive. You can't miss it. When this gesture reaches its climax at the highest possible pitch, a graceful Romanesca is being released, leading astray into a foreign key area. To me this Romanesca is like losing track in a daydream. It seems to depict the feeling of drifting away for a moment, thinking of something enjoyable before reality pulls you back into the daily grind. In more technical terms, this sequence is kinda extraordinary as it consists of six stereotypical modules which in terms of 18th century norms can be seen as being irregular, near to the point of being a syntactical error. Another thing that I've never seen on this baseline before is additional 4-3 suspensions applied to the 6th chords, so he's obviously up to open the regular compositional space a bit towards the gallant style here. However, the main thing is that a strict continuation of this sequence leads inevitably away from the primary key down the circle of fifths, taken into consideration that it already starts from B flat and leads into an additional fifth below, this is quite a remote region of key regarding the original key being C major, which is three fifths away where the 18th century norms of key relation provide a rather smaller range of modulation. Bundling the observed features altogether, its departure from a register that is not only the regional pitch climax of the piece, but in periodical terms an extreme point of pitch, syntactical irritations by the highly irregular number of sequence modules, and the distant destination of key, altogether this Romanesca appears to be a quite special situation. All shown examples so far belong to a concept of sequence that the old Italians called moti del basso. This term means bass lines that show a certain regular shape and imply certain continuous figures, dissonances and suspensions above, and there are several more than these. When browsing through the sonatas, I recognized that Scarlatti exploits as well a different kind of sequential technique that one wouldn't count among the moti del basso and that obviously indicates rather more towards the classical era and further into the 19th century. The most obvious difference, first of all, lies not just in the length of the sequential modules, but as well within the higher complexity of inner construction, as a single module can be described as a complete musical phrase that's being reiterated by transposition. In this regard, one module can contain a bunch of different compositional devices, such as pedal points, rule of the octave progressions, cadential formulas and especially modulations. The most usual formal location for such an event can be named clearly as the beginning of the second rotation. I would go that far to claim that Scarlatti already understood this kind of sequences as one of several standard strategies to enter the second part and the music you are about to listen to resembles pretty much what we commonly conceive as development. Here is a very basic example from K425. In all following examples I will always play the last bit of the closing section of the first rotation. <laughs> This is a simple but great example of a phenomenon that I call mono sequence. Sequences that consist of entire musical sentences often show just two sequential modules. What you see here is two 8 bar phrases modulating up a fifth both times finishing with a half cadence. 
If you are a schema administrator, you can enter this item on the debit side of Moti del Basso as kind of an ascending fifth sequence. I mean, it's there on the deep layer, but hard to tell if this is the genetic origin or just a byproduct. I don't want to decide and we can't ask him anymore. So next example. Same formal location for a big mono sequence in K269, where Scarlatti aims at a dramatic development by the sudden change to a minor key, which is a strategy that you can actually find a lot in the classical period. As you will see, the sequence is followed by a second one and by that causes a lot of harmonic stress by leading from A minor deep down to F minor and back to A minor again. Scarlatti constructs the first sequence around dominant pedal points, so everything is quite held in the air. The harmonic suspension is being maintained by avoiding perfect cadences for the whole section that you've just heard, which is reflecting Scarlatti's own syntactical norms that stipulate frequent cadences, a momentary deviation from the regular procedures. The modulations themselves can be conceived as rule of the octave standards by using the sixth chord of the local second degree as modulation device, but you can clearly see that there is no single cadence including a bass clause to finally confirm the new key. Instead he arrives on the 6th chord. The second sequence is but simple. It can be considered as a chain of three 7 to 1 progressions using the common 5 6th chord related to F minor, G minor and A minor producing an ascending chromatic bass line. If you want to have a schema approach to that passage it could as well be designated as a 3 stage monte. I want to show you another 3 stage monte that is a real gem and this is going to be a spectacular example. There are several slow movement minor key sonatas in three quarter time that are highly addictive and to me K434 seems to be the pinnacle of this species. I don't want to spend many words on this beautiful floating monte sequence by which Scarlatti enters the second rotation, the learn style imitations and these gloriously pulled off modulations. It's rather more about the sheer unstoppable motion it initiates and as you will see it's the awakening of a giant and it'll lead into a big badass catastrophic cadence. Okay guys, crunch time. If you maintained up to this point and during low bro presentations, speculative talk upon secluded niche topics and sloppy keyboard fingering, you rank high or respectively rather low on this kind of chart. What you deserve is one final epic example. The F major sonata 200k69 belongs to the quite special type which you can tell already from the source manuscript as the scribe did arrange it as final example of the volume which in the 18th century always has been an exceptional place and you should definitely study or listen to the entire piece as it surely is a highlight. It's not just comparatively long but as well very unique in its content, architecture and especially layout of key relations. The opulent way in which the materials are being unfolded seems to reflect on the improvisational sphere of music. As well extraordinary is the section I'm going to present. 
Not less than four sequential episodes of different kinds are chained up into some sort of fantasy or meditation and I guess this music gets pretty close to what might have been Scarlatti's improvisational routine. Don't forget that sequences are the hallmarks of 18th century improvisation. The improviser relies on them when he's got nothing specific to tell and sometimes he loses himself in this kind of situation and I think that's what this music is about. Thank mm -hmm. you. 